Okay, what is obesity? Obesity is a significant health problem that is affecting all countries with increasing rates. The World Health Organization defines it as an abnormal fat accumulation that presents health risks. It is a chronic disease. How do we measure obesity? There are several ways to measure obesity. Uh, the two most commonly used are the BMI, which is what the insurance companies use to allow us to perform surgeries. But another important way to measure it is the waist to hip ratio. Uh, with the, the waist to hip ratio essentially measures your waist size at its smallest point divided by your hip size at the largest point. Um, and that ratio, should it be greater than one, poses a higher risk of cardiovascular disease. So even patients with the same BMI can have a different waist to hip ratio. And those with a higher ratio will tend to have a higher cardiovascular risk. So if you could see our little images there, pear shape actually being healthier because the waist size is smaller. Whereas women with larger waists have a higher risk of cardiovascular disease. Um, so the BMI, that's how we really measure which patients would be candidates for surgery or medical uh, weight loss. The BMI is measured by dividing the weight in kilos by the height. A BMI, as you can see here, is considered overweight, anything over 25, and patients are in the obese category once they're over 30. Uh, morbidly obese is considered a BMI over 35. Obesity is a multifactorial disease, most of which is hard to control, right? The genetic part of it is out of our control. Even the environmental part of it is out of our control. As you drive around, all you see is McDonald's, Wendy's, Burger King, fast food places. Um, and on TV, you'll have commercials for lots of candy, cookies, Tostitos, all of these yummy things that are not very healthy. Um, that's a big industry. It's a very profitable industry. So that's not gonna change as well. So the only control we have of this multifactorial disease is our behavior. This slide shows over the last several decades what is going on in the US. Um, there was not a lot of data back in 1985, but as you can see from 1990 going forward, the percent of patients considered obese in the US has climbed from 1990, where it was about 14% or so. Um, decade, every five to 10 years, it's been recalculated and a new color shows up pretty much every 10 years as the percent continues to increase. Um, most recently, last year's data in 2022, um, two states, Kentucky and West Virginia, have obesity rates in the 45 to 50 percentile range. That is clearly an epidemic. So why do we worry about obesity? Well, we worry about obesity because of the comorbidities that it causes. Um, and it affects essentially all parts of the body. Um, as an obese patient, you're certainly at an increased risk of having strokes. That's a big major comorbidity. Um, heart and lung disease, patients usually have high blood pressure as well as heart disease. Uh, restrictive pulmonary disease as well as sleep apnea. Uh, diabetes, fatty liver. Um, and patients are at risk for a lot of different cancers most notably for women, breast and ovarian. As well with our younger patients that maybe don't have uh, obesity for very long, their main concerns are usually infertility and PCOS. Um, as they age, then the risk of cancer certainly increases. 
let's talk about the cancers associated with obesity. Again, for women, most importantly, ovarian and breast cancer. Um, to minimize the risks, you really have to get the obesity under control. And the reasoning is that obese women have higher estrogen and progesterone le levels because the estrogen and progesterone is in the fatty tissue. So as you lose weight, your levels decrease and your risks decrease. How do we treat obesity? Well, it depends upon the level of obesity. If you're just overweight and your BMI is higher than 25, which makes you overweight, but less than anywhere between 27 and 30, then it's all about lifestyle modifications, a good old, good old fashioned diet and exercise. Um, but as you get higher on the BMI scale, then you become a candidate to do either surgery or medical uh, weight loss. A BMI of over 27 will qualify you for medicines, um, but you have to have associated comorbidities, specifically high blood pressure, diabetes, or um, high cholesterol. Um, if the BMI is over 30, you qualify for medicines without needing to have any comorbidities. And that essentially um, is more common for younger patients that are overweight. So younger patients haven't had uh, obesity long enough sometimes to have high blood pressure or diabetes. Uh, so they would be candidates. Um, once you get a BMI over 35, you become a surgical candidate specifically if um, you have comorbidities. And when it comes to surgery, the comorbidities can be high blood pressure, diabetes, they could be osteoarthritis, they could be heartburn, which is uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease. Okay, so this is a slide essentially showing what I've just discussed with your BMI of 27. You have to have some sort of weight-related comorbidity specifically high blood pressure and diabetes. Um, BMI of over 30 does not require you to have a comorbidity. And weight loss, surgical weight loss for those with a BMI of over 35 with a comorbidity or over 40 without comorbidities. So let's start with the uh, medical weight loss, the pharmacological weight loss. Six different drugs have been approved by the US um, FDA for long-term use specifically Contrave. Contrave is an oral medication that works on the brain to control cravings. Um, this um, targets receptors in the brain that tell us we're hungry. Uh, Contrave can be taken three times a day with uh, meals. And the goal is um, to control your eating. In addition to any type of pharmacological medication, clearly diet and exercise has to be part of uh, weight loss. Um, the other oral medication, uh, Orlistat, is a lip lipase inhibitor. That's also an oral medication. And that essentially causes steatorrhea, which is um, you don't absorb fats, so the fat comes out in the stool. Um, let's see. The next oral medication, Entermine, has been around for a long time. Phentermine is a CNS stimulator. It stimulates the central nervous system and suppresses your appetite. So it's an appetite suppressant or also taken orally. Uh, Phentermine can cause um, high blood pressure as it does stimulate the central nervous system, um, but it does decrease the appetite. The next um, two that are listed here, Wagovi and Saxenda, they are both GLP-1 agonists. They um, are taken, uh, they're injectables. They are started at a low dose and slowly advanced to a higher dose. And they uh, decrease appetite by essentially giving you the feeling of fullness um, because the stomach uh, doesn't empty as quickly. The side effects of Wagovi and Saxenda can be uh, pancreatitis as well as gallbladder symptoms. Um, 
the last uh, weight loss drug, the MCRV, is really only uh, used selectively for patients that have um, syndromes such as bardet fatal syndrome, which um, is a genetic abnormality. This drug targets the impaired pathways with that. Okay, let's talk about surgical weight loss. Several options out there for surgical weight loss, gastric band, gastric sleeve, and the gastric bypass. The gastric band um, works by um, taking the silastic tubing, wrapping it around the upper portion of the stomach, creating a little stomach pouch above it. That band is then connected to a tubing uh, to a fill port. That fill port is then secured to the anterior abdominal wall, and that is accessed in the physician's office and we tighten the band. So the goal is to find what we call the sweet spot where we tighten the band and it keeps food in that upper stomach pouch long enough that you have several hours of satiety. Um, again, this is a surgical procedure. It takes about an hour in the operating room and patients return to work pretty quickly. Um, the downside, I guess, being that they do have to come back to the office to see us every two months or so for um, accessing the port and making the band a little tighter. That's only in the first year or so. Once we do find that uh, sweet spot, patients um, can spend months to years without needing adjustments. Average weight loss is about uh, 50 pounds in a year. It's about, about a pound a week uh, with the band. The next procedure is the gastric sleeve. With the gastric sleeve, what we're doing is we're creating a smaller stomach. Again, it takes about an hour in the operating room. The um, excess portion of the stomach that was divided is removed. Um, the patient has to heal that staple line. So as far as recovery, it takes a little bit longer to recover. That staple line has to heal. Uh, so patients are kept on a liquid um, diet for the first week, advanced to a full liquid the second week, and then purees for a couple weeks as we're trying to prote protect that staple line from any leakage. Um, those patients tend to lose weight much quicker uh, with an average of about 100 pounds over the first year. Uh, with the nice thing about the sleeve is that not only does it give you restriction because we've taken a lot of the stomach off, but the hunger hormones that were in that excised portion of the stomach, um, which is all this, patients really do have less hunger, if um, at all, sometimes patients don't have any hunger. And lastly, we have the gastric bypass. The gastric bypass is the uh, most involved out of the three. With the gastric bypass, we make a smaller stomach which you could see here. So we divide the stomach here and we leave just a small stomach pouch. We then connect that stomach to the small intestines. That small intestine connection, uh, therefore there are two small intestine connections. Um, and what this does, it does do two things as well. You uh, have restriction because there's a small stomach, but as well there's malabsorption because this whole length of small intestine um, going down until what we call the biliary limb connecting, um, the calories aren't absorbed as well. So these patients tend to lose weight even quicker, um, on average about 150 pounds in the first year. Okay. So here at Bayshore, we have a comprehensive uh, center where we offer pharmacologic as well as surgical weight loss. Uh, we have a team that includes our nursing staff as well as nutritionists and uh, psychological counselors. Um, we offer primary surgeries, we offer revisional surgeries, um, and when patients, um, should they come back from another surgeon or one of our surgeries and have regained weight, again, we offer them um, the pharmacologic or revisional options.
Okay, so we'll start with the first question. So the recovery, um, so most patients do feel good after the first week and they're having their liquid diet, their protein shakes, and they're back to their energy. However, uh, we don't let them uh, resume full activities for six weeks because with all these procedures, the incisions have to heal and we don't want them to get hernias. So no strenuous activities are lifting for six weeks. On average, patients will return to work between one and two weeks unless they have a very strenuous job and then they do need to stay out for the six weeks. Um, and as far as the results and how uh, patients will expect to do, um, part of it will depend on if they're following the program. So, you know, none of these procedures work if the patients are not ready to make this a full lifestyle change. So we offer them both medicines and or surgery as a tool, but um, they have to still diet and exercise. It's a part of any weight loss. So if you're keeping with the program and you're following with us and we're keeping you on track, patients do great. And they have basically a lifetime of um, where they've lost weight and they've lost their comorbidities and they're healthier and they're happier um, and they will not regain their weight. Um, there certainly are patients who can regain their weight because they fall back to bad habits. Um, and those patients, we try to get back in and try to help them with, you know, whatever's made them fail. Yeah, they all have potential risks. Um, so the two that we use uh, most frequently, the Contrave, which is the oral medication, um, you know, contraindication of that would be if you've had any type of seizure history, because that affects the brain, it works on the uh, receptors in the brain. So, you know, everyone is individual, you have to go through your, med um, your medicine list and see if that would be a particular uh, drug that you could have, and if it's gonna work on what your main problem is. If, so that patient would have to have, you know, cravings that need to be controlled. Uh, the other medication that we use, the Wagovi, um, again, depends on, they can't be on certain diabetic uh, medicines, but again, as on an individual basis, we have to review the medicines that a particular patient takes and see if they're uh, appropriate for that medication. And then it is very well tolerated. Um, the side effect can be a lot if you actually look at the package insert. However, the most common, um, even though it's not common, would be a pancreatitis or gallbladder issue. Uh, patients can certainly get nauseous and vomit uh, because it does affect the emptying of the stomach. Um, but that just means you have to eat less frequently because you have to allow the stomach to empty. The patients come in and have a consultation with uh, one of the surgeons in the office, and we assess what their issues are and what would be the best management for them. If they truly are morbidly obese and a surgery would be indicated, we discuss the several different surgical options and come up with what would be best for them. Once we've discussed that and discussed all the risks, benefits, pros, cons, um, we have them sit with members in our, of our staff and they'll tell them the process, which essentially is getting different clearances. Um, the insurance companies um, have uh, prerequisites that they have to um, fill. Specifically, everyone will need a psychiatric evaluation and clearance, as well as multiple uh, nutrition visits. The nutrition visits will um, be anywhere from three to six months worth of nutrition. Um, in addition to that, we have patients have uh, GI evaluation. We want them to have an upper endoscopy. We want them uh, to know, or we want to know if they have any ulcers in the stomach, any tumors in the stomach, any bacteria that would affect them postoperatively. So everyone gets a preoperative endoscopy to clear them before surgery. In addition to that, um, they'll either have a medical clearance to make sure they're overall uh, good candidate for general anesthesia, 
or if they're older and have any uh, cardiac issues, they may as well um, get a cardiac clearance as well. So some patients will get cardiac as well as pulmonary clearance if they have any um, sleep apnea or potentially have sleep apnea if they're snore, snores or if they have any asthmatic issues and we wanna make sure that they're adequately cleared from the pulmonary standpoint. Um, on average, patients from the time of their consultation um, will have surgery usually in three months, but they do have a lot of work to do in those three months. We have a nutritionist that's in the office whenever we're in the office. So not only will the surgeon speak to you and discuss, you know, where the pitfalls may be, but in addition to that, you could speak to the dietitian and she'll give you great advice as to, you know, what foods are the best for you and um, different techniques for you to lose weight. So if a patient already has the subspecialists, they could see their own doctors. So if they have their cardiologist, GI doctors, they'll see their own doctors. If they don't have any of those doctors, we'll give them uh, referrals for those doctors. We'll give them names of um, docs that we work with and they'll make their own appointments, but we'll follow up with those doctors to get the results to expedite the process of getting through this.